Hi, everyone. So my name's Oliver. I am the head of engineering at Monzo, which is, as Liz mentioned, a bank. Uh, Monzo is a startup bank based in London. We are built for the 20th century and also built in the 20, 21st century, pardon me. Uh, <laughs> and we are built with and for our community currently, which is over 600,000 customers. We have several thousand accounts opened every day. And as Liz showed you, we have those fabulous hot coral debit cards, which if, you've, if you live in London or you've been to London, you might recognize. You can sort of see them everywhere. They're hard to miss, given how fluorescent they are. Um, and with the fabulous card, we also have a fabulous app. Um, we, we basically want to build the best bank in the world. And kind of one of, our, one of our principles is to move mountains behind the scenes to make everything we do seem simple for the customer. And this talk is about some of those mountains. Um, the difference from legacy banks, hopefully, is apparent when you first open our app. We try and make sense out of your money and help you understand what money you have, what money you've spent and hopefully in the future, what best you can do with your money to make it work for you. Um, if you look at a transaction in our app, you'll see there's kind of no, none of the cramped all caps statement descriptions you might be used to. There's rich information about the transaction. We show you the location. We show you an automatically categorized category for it. Um, and we let you upload receipts, split the transaction with friends. Um, and we also perform spending analysis. This is my lunch, I think, from last week. And as you can see, I've spent a lot on lunch over time. Um, whenever you spend money, you get a real-time notification from Monzo. Everything about it is real-time. Your balance updates in real-time. And you get emoji with every transaction, one of my favorite features. Uh, over the last three years, we've built a banking system from scratch. Um, we believe that this is the only way that we can build the experience that we want. and. We also want to own our own uptime. Uh, the entire platform is built on open source software like Kubernetes. And today, I'm going to be talking about an outage, like Liz mentioned. So back to owning our uptime. Um, this is an outage we experienced last October. And from an engineering perspective, it's probably one of the worst that we had. To talk a little bit about the way we've built the bank, you can probably guess that it runs on Kubernetes, given that I'm here. Um, that's obviously one of the components that's involved in this outage. Um, Kubernetes, as you may know, stores all of the state about the cluster, the desired state and the actual state, in etcd, which is a strongly consistent key value store. And as I mentioned, we run hundreds of microservices. There's thousands running at any one time. And they like to talk to each other. We use Linkerd to do that. A single user request can turn into thousands of RPCs behind the scenes. And Linkerd helps us. Um, abstract the complexities of that. So it helps us load balance across all the replicas we have, handle retries, whatever. Um, the last thing that's crucial here are humans. Um, in any incident, something's obviously gone wrong. Kind of by definition, a human is getting involved. Um, so the story starts around two weeks before the actual outage. So we had upgraded our etcd cluster. Um, as you may know, etcd last year, released, I think it was last year, um, etcd version 3. We were previously on version 2, and we were upgrading to etcd version 3, as well as taking the cluster from 3 to 9 nodes. Um, this involved migrating to a totally new cluster. This went totally as planned. The reason I'm mentioning it here is it comes back to bite later. Um, sort of fast forward a little bit to the day before the outage. And an engineer who worked, I think, on one of our product teams was working on a new feature and we're shipping this new feature to production. It wasn't yet available for users, um, but when they shipped it to production, they saw some strange behavior, so they scaled it to zero replicas. So this is important because this left a service in the Kubernetes sense in Kubernetes that had no endpoints. Again, this is relevant later. This did not cause an outage on this day. This is totally fine. The outage itself starts when an engineer deploys a change to our ledger. So the ledger is kind of like any other service in our backend, in the sense that it's deployed the same way, it's built the same way. Um, and deploying services is very routine. It's not unusual for us to deploy 100 times a day. Um, but the ledger is quite important. Um, if you know anything about how a bank works, it's, it's the truth. Like It tells us how much money every customer has. So it's a pretty important thing. Um, and when the engineer deploys this service, he notices that 
the error rate coming from the ledger is very high, much higher than you would expect. Um, so, I mean, basically nothing's working as far as the ledger's concerned. So, standard practice, roll the ledger back, this is two minutes later, because the monitoring's, you know, firing. Um, requests continue to fail after he's rolled the ledger back, though, which would indicate the problem is not really a logic problem in the ledger itself, it's something more fundamental with the platform. So he kind of hits the panic button and asks people to help. Um, a few minutes later, it's identified that Linkerd, which as I mentioned is necessary so that our services can talk to one another, is sending traffic that's meant to go to the ledger somewhere else. So the way that Linkerd works is it watches the Kubernetes API and gets sets of endpoints from the API and then load balances traffic across those. In this case, it was sending traffic to IP addresses that didn't exist. It was, sending I the IP it was sending traffic to the IP addresses that the ledger used to have prior to this deployment and rollback. And as you may know with Kubernetes, every pod has its own IP address that's dynamically assigned when it starts. So that's why um, those IP addresses are changed. Um, so we'd actually seen some much smaller instances of this happening before. Um, so on a, on a small subset of Linkerd pods, we'd seen it routing traffic to the wrong place. And we assumed this was probably the same bug. So we ran some internal tools we developed to tell us which Linkerds were misbehaving. In this case, it tells us all of them are. So they're all sending traffic for the ledger to the wrong place, which we'd never seen before. But sort of, it's reasonable to assume it's probably the same problem on a larger scale. I mean, we had no better information. And um, the standard practice in that case is to restart the Linkerd pods that are misbehaving to kind of clear out this stale cache, um, which we start to do. We don't do it all at once. Um, a little while later, we noticed that the ones that have been restarted can't start. And a little bit of investigation shows that the kubelets on every node, which are the things that are responsible for ensuring that containers are running properly, is refusing to start the pod because it can't get the configuration that's needed to start Linkerd from the API server. The, the logs indicate that like, the API server is failing to respond to that request. So again, standard thing, restart the API servers here. Um, that actually, in this case, did fix that problem. So after the API server restart, um, the Linkerd pods started. And we continued rolling the Linkerd pods. Just after we'd finished rolling the Linkerd pods, this happened. Uh, all of the kind of alarms start to go off, and some of them are very simple. Some of them are just kind of pings against our API. And the fact that we can't respond to those is pretty dire. Like, we basically got a total outage on our hands here. Um, more investigation shows that Linkerd is spewing a lot of null pointer exceptions, and a lot of the, a lot of the, the pods, there's many hundreds of these, um, are in crash loop back off, which is where Kubernetes throttles the rate at which a pod can restart. Some furious Googling later, and we find that there's an incompatibility between the, the specific versions of Linkerd and Kubernetes that we're using. And it's triggered when there's an empty endpoint set in the API. And as I mentioned earlier, if you remember back the day before, we'd cause that situation to happen in production. There was that one service that had an empty endpoint set. So the solution was quite easy. We just deleted that service. In fact, I think there were two, but um, we deleted it. Everything comes back, so huge sigh of relief. Um, all in all, the incident lasted one hour and 21 minutes, which is a very long time. Um, not ideal. However, throughout this, and for reasons I'll come on to talk about, the majority of payments did continue to succeed. And this is kind of one of those core business metrics. It's one of the things we care the most about, like, and the, one of the things our customers care the most about, that they can access their money. So while this was a really hairy outage for our engineers, we only actually had two customer complaints from this. So as far as our customers are concerned, obviously not ideal, but not completely catastrophic either. Um, after every incident, we have a culture of post-mortems, like I hope many of you do, where we sort of analyze the root cause and we try and learn operational lessons that we can. In this case, the root cause has turned out to be complex. Um, the first one was a bug that 
eventually came to light that existed in the gRPC client library. So etcd in version 3 uses gRPC to talk between clients and servers. And this was a bug in the client. So the client is embedded in the API server. The API server has this bug. Um, and it happened when there are connection resets. Because as I mentioned earlier, we'd two weeks earlier rolled the entire cluster. They'd all experienced these connection resets. So horrible bug. The second one was the incompatibility between Kubernetes and Linkerd. As I mentioned, this only existed between very specific versions of Kubernetes and Linkerd, and it was because of a breaking API change that had been introduced in Kubernetes 1.6. Prior to 1.6, this is how an empty endpoint set was represented. After 1.6, this is how an empty endpoint set was represented. So, <laughs> tiny little change, really, but because Linkerd wasn't expecting that field to be nullable, it couldn't pass the JSON. From its perspective, it was invalid. And when you tried to access that field, it just got a null pointer exception. So, unfortunate. The last thing that was kind of a root cause, in a sense, of why this outage lasted so long was human error. So while everyone obviously acted with their best intentions, um, we did make some bad decisions. And by we, I include myself in that. Um, specifically, restarting those Linkerd pods wasn't necessary and made things far worse. Um, the reason we did that was because we didn't have enough easily accessible info about what to do. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about some of the lessons we've learned. First, I'm going to talk about the technical lessons, kind of things from an architectural perspective that I think we've learned from this. And then I'll talk about some of the more like operational things. The first one I think is really important, and actually one of the things that worked well here is this concept of defense in depth, which is traditionally a security thing, which basically is that you have multiple layers of redundant security such that they compensate for one another if one fails. And I think this can apply to reliability as well, and did in this case quite well. So if I explain a little bit about how the MasterCard uh, network works, it doesn't work on the internet. Right? It's a network in the literal sense that you connect a physical wire to MasterCard, and that's kind of fundamentally incompatible with AWS, which is where most of our most of our systems run. So we have this edge layer of data centers which connect to AWS and basically proxy traffic between MasterCard and AWS. Um, what we did in this case is we have a fallback system that exists in the edge layer that kind of in the event of a really catastrophic failure, it can continue to authorize payments even though the, everything else is down, subject to fraud controls. Um, and then when the back end comes back, it can replay those transactions. So customers didn't see transactions in their app immediately, but crucially, they could spend their money. Um, and it really paid off to have built that in this case. And I think um, this is a lesson that can apply much more broadly than just with payments. I know this is something, this is one of the main reasons I think Netflix built the um, Hystrix library. Um, the second thing I want to talk about Another thing popularized by Netflix, actually, is chaos engineering. So this is something we were not doing. However, I think if we were, this would have caught the issue before it became an issue. Um, so chaos engineering is defined as the discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. And Netflix has this toolkit for doing this called the Simeon Army, and one of the primary constituents of this army is called the Chaos Monkey, which is this um, thing that you would run in an environment, in this case if we'd been running it in production, which kills nodes um, in a controlled way to give you confidence that if that happens in an uncontrolled way, which we acknowledge is inevitable, then you know how your system will behave. And I think if we'd been doing this in production, we would have seen that Linkerd's cannot restart safely and we would have caught that long before that was an actual problem. I think this is particularly interesting in, in a cloud-native and Kubernetes sense, and there are some projects starting to emerge around this. I think there's one called KubeMonkey, and I know Bloomberg has built a tool to do this as well. I don't think any are quite as sophisticated as the Netflix Simeon army, but I'd expect to see this, some, this being something that the, that the community and companies like us even might focus on in the coming months and years. The next things, I think, are more operational. 
So in this outage, our monitoring did a very good job of telling us that this deployment of the ledger had broken everything. But it did not do a very good job of telling engineers that this gradual process of restarting these Linkerd pods was slowly killing the platform until it was too late. Like, there were metrics for that, but they're just sort of buried too deeply in places and not kind of in your face enough. And I think putting this stuff in people's faces is definitely a good practice. And I think one of the lessons we've learned from this is, is in addition to making the monitoring system better, we should make it a practice to sort of think about all of this stuff more than we were up front when building services and make sure that these things are really visible to people and impossible to ignore. The last thing I want to talk about is um, one, of the, one of the really good aspects, I think, of Monzo's culture, and one of the main aspects of our culture, most important, is transparency. So as I mentioned, we're building this bank with our community, and what that means is internally we have this concept of defaulting to something being transparent. And this means that an argument has to be made to keep something private rather than an argument needing to be made to make it public. And you can see lots of examples of this with how we're building the company. We have this community forum where we share tons of stuff that we're doing. We have open office events. We publish our annual reports publicly. We have a public product roadmap. And the company, in no small part, exists thanks to crowdfunding. Um, and in this case, in the spirit of transparency, we published this public post-mortem on our community forum, um, both because it's the right thing to do, and also because I really like reading other people's post-mortems and nerding out on them. I think it's one of the ways you learn the most about a system, is sort of looking at how it goes wrong. This was read by thousands, probably tens of thousands of people, including, crucially, people in the Kubernetes community. And I thought the response was fantastic to this, that the community really sort of took it upon themselves to help us understand these issues and fix them. And if, if we'd not been forthcoming about what happened, I don't think we would have benefited in this way. We probably wouldn't understand the root cause of some of these even now, because some of them are so low level. And I think lots of companies are very good about talking about their successes, but not their failures. But I think we could all learn from each other's experiences, good and bad. So I think embrace the community in every way that you can. So that's about it. I would like to have a shameless plug. If you, think these, um, <laughs> if you think these challenges are interesting and these technologies are interesting, please come and find me, tweet at me, whatever. Um, we would love to have you on board. Thanks very much.